Hello everyone, um, for those of you who haven't met me, I'm Kaz, I work at Glenfield and I am going to talk to you about fever in ICU. Um, this probably take about, depending how much I waffle, probably about 45 minutes, so it shouldn't be too long. Um, so the, the first thing is don't worry, I am not about to tell you that if your patient has fever you need to take um, cultures and you need to send off their urine and do a chest x-ray. I am presuming that you all know that already. Um, but what I'm actually going to talk about is maybe some of the bits of fever that you don't know about and um, which doesn't involve taking cultures. So we're going to talk about why this is important in intensive care, sort of how common it is. Um, we're going to talk a bit about how um, what happens normally when we regulate our blood, our uh, body temperature? This might sort of ring some distant bells for some back from medical student days, but what happens normally, what happens in fever, and what happens um, in other instances of raised body temperature? Um, we're going to talk a bit about whether fever is good for us or bad for us. Is it helpful or is it not? And then I'm going to go through a little bit of the literature about whether we should be treating it, um, especially in intensive care. Um, I think one of the most important things that I'm going to talk about um, over this talk is the non-infectious causes of, of fever in intensive care, of which there are lots. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the other things that can raise your body temperature. Um, and interestingly, at the Glenfield, we've actually had definitely one out of two of these and possibly both of them in the last month or so. Um, so these do happen, even if they are rare and they're important to watch out for. And then at the end, we'll do a very kind of brief what my approach is to, to fever in the ICU. So, uh, good quote to start with by William Osler. So, uh, humanity has but three, um, oh, I've got that covering, that great enemies, fever, famine and war. And of these, by far the greatest, by far the most terrible is fever. And he was writing this, you know, a long time before we discovered penicillin. Um, and actually that was probably what killed most people young so infectious diseases are the reason that people didn't make it past um, childhood didn't make it into young adulthood and we know that sepsis kills and we probably had this rammed down you know at us rammed down our throats that sepsis kills every second counts you have to get your antibiotics you've got a golden hour if you don't get your antibiotics in in your golden hour then your patient's um outcomes will be much worse so we know that sepsis is bad um we also i feel as a medical student get sort of rammed into us that any temperature is an infection until proven otherwise and that's not necessarily true um, so, but we have to balance this sepsis, every second count's got to get the antibiotics in um, early with another really present and direct threat to sort of humanity as we know it, which is, oh, it's now just frozen. Let's try again. Yeah, here we go, which is antibiotic resistance. And this really is an increasing problem worldwide and it's partly to do with when we sort of invented when we discovered uh, penicillin in the 30s um well 1928 was when it was first uh, discovered by fleming um, and then marketed mass marketed throughout the 30s um we used it for everything we used it for every fever we used it for every infection and we used it for things which it doesn't work against so we used it for things that aren't bacterial so we used it against viral infections and i can remember being a kid and getting the uh, banana penicillin from the GP pretty much every time we had a cough or a cold I think although that I think has got a lot better so we we know that antibiotic resistance is increasing worldwide um, partly that's due to human use partly that's due to the fact that we put antibiotics in animal feed to try and prevent sort of infections in herds of animals um, and we essentially overuse them and the bacteria are clever bugs and they are fighting back um, this, uh, again, the, the uh, printout on the right of the screen, the pseudomonas that is resistant to everything, all the antibiotics that I could list, plus some that I'd never heard of before, I find this absolutely terrifying, but we even in our practice in England see um, highly resistant pseudomonas in the fact that we're having to use sort of higher doses of tazacin because it's only intermediate sensitivity to that. Um, and so antibiotic stewardship is as important as treating our infection. So it's important to know what's an infection will get better with antibiotics and what isn't. 
So a little bit of revision, what is normal temperature regulation? So uh, firstly, what, what is normal body temperature? Well, actually, you know, normal varies quite widely. These figures are taken from um, over 700 measurements in 148 healthy men and women. Um, and they found that, that normal was anything from 35.6 to 38.2. So actually quite a wide range uh, with a mean of 36.8. Um, Temperature is generally lower in the early morning um, and it peaks in the afternoon and the late evening, which is why when you have a fever, you feel reasonably awful, um, usually in the evening. That's because your fever is generally going up at that point. Um, and there's various conditions, which means that we'll have a lower mean body temperature. So if you're hypothyroid, um, your temperature might be a bit lower. And conversely, if you're hyperthyroid, it would be a bit higher. And people with raised BMIs and also um, patients with cancer will generally have a higher baseline temperature. So that's probably where normal is. Um, so certainly 37 is not a fever. 37 is kind of within the bounds of normal. And like I say, it depends what time you measure it during the day. So you will remember back to um, learning this at med, at med school that actually it's our um, hypothalamus that is the control of our body temperature. And our hypothalamus sets our body temperature at a certain point, say 36.8, and then the blood bathing in it, if that blood is colder than 36.8, the hypothalamus goes, right, we're cold, we need to heat the body up. And we do environmental stuff. So we'll put on a jumper, we'll shut the window, we'll turn the radiator up, um, and we'll also shiver, and that produces heat. Um, and our, um, our blood vessels will vasoconstrict um, as well. Uh, so we conserve more heat. And conversely, if the blood bathing your hypothalamus, which is set at that, say, 36.8, um, is warmer than 36.8, then our hypothalamus um, sets off a train of things that, that cool us down. So we take off the jumper, we open the window, we turn off the heating. Um, while our uh, blood vessels vasodilate to our skin, we start to sweat. So all of these things will then reduce that body temperature until your blood is at the, the set temperature that the hypoth hypothalamus wants it to be at, so 36.8. Um, what happens during a fever is that the hypothalamus upregulates. So rather than being set at 36.8, it sets itself at 38. And that means that if your body is at normal temperature at the time, your hypothalamus tells you that you are cold because it is set at 38 and your body is at 36A or 37. So all of those things um, it puts into place. So you start to shiver, you know, you get rigors. If, if you ever have a patient who's having rigors and doesn't have a temperature, they will have a temperature. It's just coming, gonna come after the rigors. So you shiver, you feel cold. So you do the environmental stuff, you know, how cold you feel when you're running a high temperature, when you, when you're unwell at home, that's why. Um, what's different in um, the hyperthermia syndromes that we're going to talk about? And these are things like neurolept malignant syndrome, um, like serotonin syndrome um, and malignant hyperpyrexia is rather than your hypothalamus reset at a higher point and then is telling your body to do those things to bring your body temperature up to that. Um, what actually happens is uh, basically your body temperature increases in an uncontrolled fashion, irrespective of the hypothalamus and the cooling mechanisms. So that's um, the environmental stuff, um, your skin vasodilatation, the sweating isn't enough to overcome that sort of uh, spiraling up heating of, of the body. So they're quite different. So how, why is this important? Is this important in the ICU? Well, yeah, it's pretty much one of the commonest signs that we see. So almost all of our ICU patients, and I appreciate that 25 to 80% is quite a wide, <laughs> quite a wide range, um, but most of the, the papers come out with um, more than half of ICU pa patients have an episode of raised temperature at some point when they're in the ICU. Um, I can't, unfortunately get you to sort of shout out answers for me because I would for the next question um, but I would ask you what percent of patients um, who have a raised body temperature actually have an infection you know what percent of fever do we see is infectious in the ICU and actually if there's one thing that you take from this talk this is it it's about 50 percent so 50 percent 
um, of the fevers that we see are not due to infections and therefore will not necessarily respond to antibiotics. And that's really important. We've talked a little bit about this. So the two different types of raised temperature are fever, or also called pyrexia, um, and then the other type is the hyperthermia syndromes. So fever pyrexia, so it's common. This is the thing that we see all the time. Um, how do you define a temperature? Well, this is good because actually we don't need to, to look this up. The uh, Infectious Diseases um, Society of America and the Society of Critical Care Medicine have agreed that 38.3 and above is what you classify a fever as in intensive care. If you work, for example, in Hemonc, um, they will often use a slightly lower temperature, say 38, say a fever, but certainly for us 38.3, and I don't think there's much point doing cultures uh, less than that. Um, we've talked about this, you get this upregulation of the thermostatic set point in the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus goes, right, I need to heat the body up and then does all of those sort of environmental and physical, physiological things to heat up the body. Um, and what actually uh, causes the change is that you get these exogenous and endogenous pyrogens, and these act on the hypothalamus to increase the hypothalamus' um, set point. Exogenous ones are things like... Um, predominantly kind of bacteria and their products, so toxins, endotoxins, and they stimulate your white blood cells to release these, endo these endogenous pyro pyrogens. And endogenous pyro pyrogens, sorry, I cut my teeth in, um, are all the substances that the body produces that kind of trigger this alteration in set points. And they include things like your cytokines, your interleukin-1, your tumor necrosis factor, alpha, interleukin-6, and interferons. Um, and they work by enhancing the prostaglandin E2 production in the preoptic region of the hypothalamus. But suffice to say, you've got exogenous um, pyrogens um, such as uh, toxins produced by bacteria, endogenous pyrogens such as cytokines and other inflammatory mediators, and they are the things that reset our hypothalamus to a bit higher, and that's how we get fever. Um, and because it's to do with a, a hypothalamic uh, set point, actually things like antipyretics, so paracetamol, non they are effective. Compare that to the really rare hyperthermia syndromes. Um, these are normally patients that are a lot hotter and temperatures usually more than 40 degrees. And certainly temperatures of more than 41 or 42 are not only very unlikely to be due to infections, much more likely to be due to these hyperthermia syndromes, but also a temperature of 42 and above unless that's rapidly treated is universally fatal because at that point you start cooking your proteins. So that's the point at which you really need to sort of step in. Um, and in the hypothermia syndromes, this isn't related to the hypothalamic set point. So that stays the same. You just get lots of peripheral mechanism of heat production and they outweigh the sort of heat loss that your body can do. Um, and um, things like paracetamol and non-steroidal don't work. So what you need is physical cooling for them. We'll come back to that a little bit later on. So why do we have fever? I don't know if any of you have had the misfortune to have listened to me talk before, but you'll probably realise that I quite like medical history. Um, although when I was writing this talk, I found that what was way more interesting was actually a bit of evolutionary biology. Um, so fever, they estimate, has been around for about four million years. And it is seen in basically all mammals, most re all reptiles, amphibians, fish, and even in some invertebrates. Um, and that's why I've got these handsome fellows here. So, so the lizard on the left, what lizards do if they're cold blooded is they will take themselves. Um, so, so what they would normally do is bask on rocks in the sunshine to bring up their body temperature. That's you know, how cold blooded animals work. But actually that puts you at an evolutionary disadvantage because obviously if you're out in the sunshine basking in the sun, you are more visible to predators to be eaten. But they will, um, all these guys, so the, the lizards, the, the fish and the invertebrates will all um, exhibit what's called environmental fever. So if they are infected with a bacteria or a pathogen or a, um, or, or a parasite, they will um, take themselves to a um, warmer part to, to bring their body temperature up. So the lizards will bask on the sun for longer. Um, this rather handsome fish at the top right corner uh, this is a guppy. This is a male because he's got a fancier tail to, to attract the women. I don't know if any of you keep tropical fish, but if any of you want to, uh, the guppies are a really good one to start with because they're quite hardy, they're quite easy to look after, and they can be um, fresh water as well as salt water. Um, and interestingly, 
the reason I've got a guppy in my talk is not just that um, I think they're pretty, um, is because captive um, fish in tanks in people's houses don't do so well than fish in the wild when they get infected. You are more likely, if you have a, a fish that's kept in a tank, that fish is more likely to die if they get uh, an infection or a parasite than a fish in the wild. And they think that's probably to do with the fact that you cannot get those temperature gradients in a tank that you could in a river or in a sea. Um, so they cannot bring their temperature up in the same way that a fish in the sea or in a river would be able to do to bring their temperature up, to sort of have that environmental fever to try and get rid of those parasites. Um, the bottom right hand side, that is a goliath, that is the tadpole of a goliath toad. To be perfectly honest, I have no idea whether that exhibits um, environmental fever. I just thought it's a brilliant photo of a massive tadpole, which is why I put it in there. But there, there has to be an evolutionary advantage to all of these animals still um, having fever. So all the mammals having fever and all of the amphibians, because it, increasing their body temperature will put them somewhere more at risk. It'll either put the lizards out basking in the sun, more likely to be eaten by predators, or for the fish, it'll put them in more shallow water because that'll be where the warmer the warmer water is, which again would make them a bit more visible, a bit more visible to predators. So there must be an evolutionary advantage to having fever. So what about in us? What about in humans? So there's been quite a lot of research looking at what fever does. And actually, having a raised body temperature enhances our resistance to infection. So it also um, generates quite a lot of, um, in, of um, the immune response. It promotes our T cell activation. It ups the antibody and cytokine production. It can stimulate um, more of our um, innate and um, adaptive uh, immune response. So it stimulates neutrophils and macrophages. Um, and it slows microorganism growth because the bacteria are also designed to work at an optimal temperature and bacteria that generally live in our bodies as sort of harmful colonizers like to work at 37 they don't like to grow at 38.3 and um, interestingly for your antibiotics if you have a fever you actually need less antibiotic to kill off your your bacteria so it actually reduces the minimal inhibitory concentration of antimicrobial agents. Um, heat shock proteins, uh, so these are a whole, a whole sort of new bag of, of things that I didn't know that much about, um, but they're kind of important sort of chaperones for protein folding and protein sort of unfolding. Um, and they're basically critical for cellular pr protection. And as the name suggests, they are um, produced in higher numbers when we are warmer, but they're also produced in uh, response to kind of things like shock so basically, they are reduced in they are produced in response to any sort of threats to the body. Um, and, and then there's the behavioral things of actually, you know, sort of good communal living. If you feel rubbish when you've got an infectious disease and you stay at home and in your bed, you are less likely to spread it to the rest of the people who you live with in your community. And certainly for the vast majority of our evolution, we've lived in hunter gatherer uh, groups. Um, and now we live in sort of much bigger groups and cities, but actually having feeling poorly and staying at home is a good way of not spreading that infection between your community. Interestingly, um, when you have a fever, that also increases the amount of melatonin that is produced. And obviously melatonin is the thing that makes us feel sleepy when it gets to be dark. So actually not only does a fever make you feel a bit rubbish, but it also makes you sleepy, which will also keep you at home. So there's lots of things that fever is good at, um, but there's also bad stuff that it does. So the hotter we are, the more our, the more um, it increases cardiac output. And certainly if you're sort of on the edge of, of your physiology, if you've maybe got a heart that's not brilliant, that, that can be a problem. It does increase your oxygen consumption. So if you are hotter, you use up more oxygen and that's it's considerable. So it's about 10% increased oxygen consumption for every one degree increase in temperature, um, which again could be really important for our patients if they are already hypoxic to start with. Um, it also increases CO2 production. So any sort of hypermetabolic state such as fever will increase your oxygen consumption, your CO2, CO2 production, which again, isn't gonna be brilliant if you're looking after patients with bad lungs. Um, and of course it increases that energy expenditure. So you've got to think about what your physiological reserve is of your patient. So 
there are good things that it does in fighting infection but actually you know we live now in a modern era where we have modern medicine where we have access to antibiotics and other antimicrobials is it as important now as it would have been in our evolutionary past don't know there's good parts and there's bad parts about it so what is what can the literature tell us well this actually is really important and i'm going to um, really interesting. And I'm going to start off by giving you just a quick run through of some of the papers that look at is, in, is being able to mount a temperature good for you in critical care? And the answer is pretty resoundingly yes. So this is um, looking at the uh, peak temperature in the first 24 hours in when you're admitted to ICU. And they initially looked at um, all of the Australian and New Zealand um, uh, ICUs, that was about, it was just shy of 130 units, um, it was over 250,000 patients, of which just over 10%, I think 11% had infection, and then they sort of validated that with the UK cohort, which was a bit bigger, so 201 ICUs, um, just over 350,000 um, patients, of which a higher proportion, um, just over a quarter, so 28% had infection. And they divided the group into ones that, that they felt had infection, the ones that they felt didn't have infection. And you can see that certainly from the infection point of view, and if you don't have an infection, your highest mortality is if you are cold. So if your temperature is 36 or less when you get admitted to ICU, you have the highest chance of dying. Um, if you have an infection, actually the probably best temperature to be at for the lowest mortality is in the 39s, 39 to 39.4. If you don't have an infection, um, actually at those very high temperatures, um, then the mortality rises again. And so actually, if you don't have an infection, it's probably best to be at a normal body temperature of 37.5 to 37.9. So this certainly tells us that actually, if you've got an infection and you are able to mount a fever in that first 24 hours, you may do better. Um, doesn't really tell us anything about whether we should treat it or not. What about this one? So ARDS, that's the other thing that we like looking after because it's very much an ICU thing. And this again, this was looking at a secondary analysis of one of the ARDSnet papers. So one of the um, big ARDS studies, which was actually looking at uh, whether lots of fluids or less fluids uh, were better for you in acute respiratory distress syndrome and whether a pulmonary artery catheter or a central venous catheter um, was best for you and this was done in the in the mid 2000s I think it was about 2006 and for the temperature stuff they did a sort of secondary analysis so that wasn't what this study was set up for it was just they looked back on it and they looked back on uh, what the body temperature was in the first um, the first day and then on study day two and how that related to 90 day mortality for patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, and they found that most of them had a sort of normal temperature. So the mean baseline temperature at admission. So on that day one in these patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome was 37.5. Um, just under a quarter were pyrexial by uh, the definition that we discussed earlier. So had a temperature of greater than 38.3. And about one in 20, so 5% were cold. So they had a temperature of less than 36. Um, and they found that increasing temperature was a significant pr predictor of uh, increasing 90 day survival. And you can see from this chart that actually the ones who were really cold had the highest chance of dying. Um, and that sort of that mortality decreases as the patients get hotter and actually the lowest mortality was seen in the patients with very high temperatures so greater than 39.5 um, and they sort of had a look through it and they did some um, adjustments uh, so for the primary cause of ARDS because we know that generally patients who have sort of ARDS that's caused because they've got bad stuff in their lungs like pneumonia do better than somebody who has an extra pulmonary cause of ARDS such as pancreatitis or cellulitis or, or severe sepsis. So they adjusted for the primary cause of ARDS and they also adjusted for the severity of illness at baseline, so the Apache 3 scores. And they still found that increasing temperature was associated with better survival in ARDS. And they actually found that every uh, one degree centigrade that your temperature went up, your mortality fell by 15%. So that's kind of probably telling us that being able to generate a fever is a good thing. Um, 
doesn't necessarily again tell us that having the fever or we shouldn't treat it. So is there any information that tells us whether we should treat a fever in ICU? Well, there's not a lot. As most things in ICU, it's quite ICU light. It's quite um, evidence light. Um, there is this paper. This is a quite small study. Uh, I think it's French, although I might have made that up. Um, they had about 100 patients in each uh, group. They had 101 in the cooled group, 99 in the other. These were sick patients who had septic shock and were on vasopressors um, to start with. And what they did is they externally cooled them. So they used a sort of, you know, something like the Arctic sun to, to cool them down for the first 48 hours. Um, and it, with the groups, they got a good sort of separation in temperature. So the cooled group were at an average of 36.8 and the not cooled group were at an average of 38.4. So febrile as per our definition. Um, and they found that actually you could turn the vasopressors, you could reduce them by half in significantly more of the, the group who were cooled. Um, and certainly in that first 12 to 24 hours, and it was numerically more in the next 36 to 48 hours, but it wasn't actually significantly different. So you could turn your vasopressors down much more quickly. You could reverse the shock more quickly in the group that were cooled. And actually they did show a mortality benefit. So at day 14, they showed that less people died, had died in the cooled group compared to the sort of norm, the, the group that they didn't cool down. Uh, they had mortality rates of 19% of those who they actively cooled versus 34% in the ones who they didn't cool. But actually, when you looked further out of this data, so ICU discharge mortality and then hospital discharge, while still numerically the numbers, you know, you've got a slightly higher survival in the cooled group, that didn't reach significance. So what they sort of concluded from this was actually early cooling might mean that you reverse your shock more quickly and it improves short term mortality. But we're not really sure, sure about the longer term out outcome. But yeah, if you've got a patient who's got septic shock and you control their temperature, that might be worth that's There's definitely a little bit of evidence for that. What about what we actually do? So we, we treat fever all the time, don't we? Because we've all had fevers and we've known that and we know that that doesn't feel very nice and feels pretty awful and we're caring people and we want to look after our patients we want to make them feel better so probably one of the commonest drugs that we prescribe in ICU is paracetamol or um, acetaminophen acetaminophen which is what basically everyone else in the world calls it apart from, apart from us um, but actually are we doing our patients a disservice by treating their fever does it make a difference well the Aussies tried to answer this question. So this was again, big Australian New Zealand trial, 700 patients, they did it, it was quite recent, so 2013 to 2014, in 23 different adult ICUs, um, and they treated patients who had known or suspected infection and the temperature more than 38 um, until, and they gave them a gram of IV paracetamol um, every six hours, so four times a day, or a 5% dextrose placebo, and the, the bottles were identical glass bottles and looked exactly the same. So it was um, it was randomised controlled. And they carried on treating them with paracetamol until the patients were either discharged, they died, they just had resolution of fever or they'd stopped their antibiotics. And their primary um, end point was ICU free days. And actually in the first month, so in the first 28 days. And ICU free days, is it's a bit of a sort of weird double negative, but essentially it's a composite outcome of ICU mortality and um, ICU length of stay. Um, and they basically found no significant difference at all in the um, patients who received paracetamol to the patients who received placebo with the ICU um, free days. Uh, they found they had secondary outcomes of mortality and again found no difference there. Basically, 15.9% of the patients who had paracetamol died at 90 days versus 16.6% of those who had placebos. That wasn't significant. Um, I mean, interestingly, what they did show is that you couldn't actually cool patients down very much by giving them regular paracetamol um, because their patients who received paracetamol had a mean temperature of 37 versus 37.3 in the ones getting placebo and the peaks were 38.4 if you got paracetamol and 38.6 if you got placebo so it probably tells us that actually paracetamol doesn't really control temperature particularly well in our critically ill patients I mean if, if you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves though it is quite interesting 
to see that if you have paracetamol and you die, you do it more slowly. I suspect that is just hypothesis um, generating rather than anything else. But that is uh, an interesting thing that they did find from this study was that actually in the non-survivors who had paracetamol, they had a significantly longer length of stay um, than the non-survivors who received placebo. But I'm not sure that's necessarily a, a good thing. So I guess the answer from this is we don't really know. Um, we don't really know whether treating a fever is beneficial. We know that being able to mount a fever is probably um, confers a survival benefit, both in humans and, and in sort of the wider in the animal kingdom. Um, so it's slightly un inconclusive there. Um, I, I don't think there's enough evidence from this, though, to uh, tell us that what we're doing is harmful yet. But I think it's a bit of a watch this space when it comes to treating fever in ICU. What about the thing that I said to you was the most important part, I think, of this lecture, and that's the non-infectious causes of fever in ICU. Um, this is an incredibly long list. Um, and I think what's important to remember is that all of these things not only can cause fever, but might actually A, not get better um, with antibiotics, B, increase, you, you might increase antibiotic resistance by giving these patients antibiotics if this is what's causing their, fe causing their fever. And also some of them, you know, such as a myocardial infarction or PE, if you treat that with penicillin, the patient will not get better. Um, there's going to be a few that I'm just going to concentrate on. So the first one, alcohol and drug withdrawal. Obviously, the patients will come in on various alcohol and drugs that they withdraw from. But actually, probably what's much more common is our patients withdrawing from medications that we've given them. So always think about the possibility of that when you've got a patient with fever. Um, drug fever. So conversely, the most common uh, medicine that we give in ICU that can cause drug fever is penicillin, which is great. So penicillin based antibiotics. Um, so that is always something. And I think that that is if you have a patient who's got a swinging pyrexia and it's always at the same time or the same times each day, always have a look at the drug chart. Um, likewise, if you've got a patient who's got a fever and they've got raised eosinophils and or a rash, always think about drug fever there. Um, neurogenic fever. So this is pretty common. Um, for anyone who works in, an IC, uh, in a neuro ICU, so probably certainly over half, maybe up to 70% of patients who are presenting with sort of central nervous system conditions. Um, most common in subarax, followed by intracranial hemorrhages, followed by traumatic brain injuries, um, but also can be seen in intraventricular bleeds and in certain tumours. And it usually happens quite early on, so within a couple of days of admission. And it's usually not swinging. It's usually up and it stays up. Um, but we know that brains don't particularly like being hot for that uh, raised uh, metabolic um, rate, baseline rate. Um, and it's one of the things that we should actively treat in our patients with poor brains uh, or with, with any sort of damage to their, their brains. Um, MI, uh, this is quite interesting. So sort of in the pre-PCI era, um, quite a number of patients who had myocardial infarctions, so between a quarter and a half, um, had uh, exhibited fever. Um, you can actually prevent the fever by giving them beta blockers. Um, and there was a recent study in the sort of post-primary PCI time, which is now kind of, you know, up to date with what we're doing, that actually if you have fever if, with an ST elevation MI, this predicts sort of much worse uh, myocardial injury and less salvage myocardium on cardiac MRI when tested. And that was about sort of 16% of the patients. So actually, if you have a patient who's um, had an MI and has a fever secondary to their MI, be wary that actually that's quite a big MI and um, that, that could cause some significant problems for the patient. Um, and the same really goes for PE and DVT. We sort of think about them as... Um, you know, we think about thromboembolic things as really just causing obstructive problems, particularly with PE, but actually it is also a massively inflammatory condition. Um, and this is probably quite a common cause of fever in our patients in, on ICU. And so should always be something that you think about. And finally, lots of cancers. So we think about um, um, the haematological cancers causing fever. So particularly non-Hodgkin's and Hodgkin's, but actually, um, um, the acute and chronic leukemias can, and loads of other cancers, ovarian, renal cell, hepatocellular, sarcomas, um, anything that's affecting your hypothalamus, which is understandable, pheos, um, 
and anything that spreads to the liver, so breast, lung or bowel with liver mets can also cause fever. So there's quite a lot of, um, in, of cancers that can also cause fever. So always think about them. So having looked at the sort of all the evidence and having read all the papers, when do I think we should treat fever? And what is it likely to be? So if you've got a patient with what we would consider kind of lower grade fever, so um, 38.3 to 38.8, that might be, that's quite likely to be infectious in our patients. It may be non-infectious. Um, I would only consider treating if you've got a bad brain or a bad heart. Um, it is worth thinking about if you've got a patient with severe ARDS, we've talked about the increase in oxygen consumption, the increase in CO2 production, um, and it may be that actually cooling that patient down or uh, taking their temperature down to normal means that you can actually sort of turn down all the knobs on the ventilator and, and prevent further ventilator associated lung, in, uh, lung injury. Um, vasopressor resistant shock, that's also something that uh, we've talked about there being a bit of um, evidence for. So if you cool them down, you may be able to reduce their vasopressors. And you can use antipyretics, though they paracetamol may not be that effective, and you can also use physical cooling. If you've got a patient that's a bit hotter, so 39 to 41, that usually is infectious. And often when we're thinking with the patients with these high temperatures, uh, gram negative sepsis or viral infections, they can often have much higher temperatures. So you wanna think about treating them aggressively if they've got bad hearts, bad, bad brains, you're gonna strongly consider in your uh, patients with bad lungs or vasopedic shock. And again, antipyretics, but you might need physical cooling. If you've got a patient who's got a temperature of greater than 41 and definitely greater than 42, this is invariably non-infectious, but you need to treat it aggressively. Um, temperatures greater than 42 for any length of time are rapidly fatal if not treated. And you will need to use physical cooling because antipyretics won't be um, helpful here, because as we say, it's not to do with the hypothalamus, it's to do with um, your body not being able to, to sort of counteract the heating mechanisms. Um, and you might need to think about invasive cooling. So you might need to think about, um, you know, we, we talk about things like putting people on ECMO to cool them or, or um, sort of, you know, peritoneal cavity or bladder, uh, bladder lavage with cold fluids, cold IV fluids. Um, but th these are the ones that you really want to get on top of quickly. I'm going to talk a little bit about the hyperpyrexia syndromes. Where are we? Sort of 40 minutes or so. Um, these are kind of the big ones that you're going to see in the ICU. I'm not going to talk about all of them, um, but they're ones to think about, especially if you've got a patient whose temperature is over 40. So thyrotoxicosis, so thyroid storm, um, heat stroke. So we might see classic exertional heat stroke in marathon runners. And then the classic heat stroke is actually, it's just a very hot day and you've got an elderly frail patient who doesn't have the sort of sensible, you know, who doesn't have the, those cooling mechanisms that we have. And certainly if we're going to be seeing temperatures like we did last summer, even if it's only for a short amount of time in a country that is not set up for temperatures of, you know, of over 40, then we will be seeing more heat stroke. Malignant hyperpyrexia, I think that all the anaesthetists in the room learn a lot about that, but as intensivists, we need to know about it as well, because these patients may well come to intensive care after um, their episode in theatre, um, where they, they have their MH, um, but it's also going to be something that we may see de novo on ICU because some of them can be related to administration of succimethonium, for example. And also if we increasingly use things like the anaconda where we can give anesthetic gases on ICU, um, we might actually see sort of patients who are primarily presenting with malignant hyperpyrexia actually on the ICU. So it's something to be aware of. But the two that I really wanted to talk about today are serotonin syndrome and neurolect malignant syndrome. So firstly, this is a bit of a busy slide, apologies for that, serotonin syndrome. So this is a spectrum and it sort of ranges from really quite mild um, sort of symptoms of a bit of a tremor, maybe feeling sort of a little bit out of sorts, slightly dilated pupils, a little bit sweaty, um, all the way up to kind of lethal hypothermia. So that temperature that's 42 and rapidly climbing um, and things like seizures. Um, we talk about a classic triad. So we talk about mental status change, so anxiety or delirium agitation. We talk about autonomic hyperactivity. So they're 
um, hypertensive, tachycardic, they might have GI upset with DMV, they will often have flushed, sweaty skin, dilated pupils, um, really dry mucous membranes. If you listen to their bowel sounds, they've got really active bowel sounds. And then the sort of third part of the triad is the neuromuscular abnormalities. So these patients often um, exhibit tremor, a tremor, they might have hyperreflexia, um, and often that's much worse in the lower limbs and the upper limbs. You might be able to elicit clonus and they'll be hypertonic. Um, and I think that actually we probably miss mild versions of serotonin syndrome, particularly in our elderly patients quite often. So there are lots of things that the patient comes in on that will make them more likely to get serotonin syndrome. Loads of people are on SSRIs or SNRIs. Um, in fact, all people kind of by the age of 70 seem to be given sertraline. You seem to get sertraline and aspirin when you reach 70, irrespective of what's wrong with you. Um, but there's lots of other things that people might be on at home that can increase their risk of serotonin syndrome. So cocaine, ecstasy, amphetamines, um, including the methylphenidate, which is the treatment for um, ADHD, um, amitriptyline, lithium, and of course, a lot of patients take St. John's wort, um, and because they don't think that that's, you know, because they think it's herbal, they may not even tell you that they take St. John's wort, but that can increase their risk of serotonin syndrome. And then there's loads of stuff that we give them um, that can increase their risk of serotonin syndrome. So particular ones to watch out for, the antibiotic linazolid, but also tramadol, metazapine, and actually the two that I think that I would be less aware of, so on Dancitron and fentanyl. All of these can increase the risk of serotonin syndrome. Um, what do you do if you think someone's got it? Well, it's reasonably simple. You can you stop the agents. Um, treatment is generally supportive, um, plus or minus benzodiazepines, and you will need to actively call them. Like I say, paracetamol is not going to do anything here, so you need to actively call them if they are hot. Um, there are some drug treatments. We generally give something called cyproheptadine, but it can only be given orally. So obviously you need good GI absorption. And actually we had a potential patient with serotonin syndrome recently at the Glenfield, and we don't think we could get cyproheptadine. So we gave them promethazine instead, and that could be given IV. Um, serotonin syndrome is more common in older age. So it, it should be one of the things that you think about, not only in your patients that are hot, but also in your patients that are delirious or agitated. So always have a good look at the drug chart um, and have a think about whether this could be serotonin syndrome and actually can I stop things that will make it better. The next one is one that we definitely have had, I think, recently on intensive care. And actually, the only reason that I thought about it was because I'd been writing this presentation. So neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So again, this is rare. But this is a life threatening, um, don't know why neurological is written there. So uh, twice, life threatening uh, neurological syndrome. And it rather than triad, it has a classic tetrad. So there's four things you look for. So again, you get the mental status change. They get delirious and agitated. Um, they get uh, hypertonic. So they get what's called lead pipe rigidity. Uh, they have very high temperature and it usually is definitely over 40 and may well be 41, 42 or higher than that. And they get dysautonomia, a dysautonomia, a bit like in serotonin syndrome. So they're hypertensive, they're tachycardic, they're tachypneic, they're often sweating. But this happens only in association with neuroleptic drugs. So they have to be either on antipsychotics or we are giving them antipsychotics. The thing is, it's most commonly seen with probably the antipsychotic that we use most commonly on ICU, which is haloperidol, but it can also occur with risperidone or lansipine or another drug we give very commonly on ICU, like it's Smarty, so metoclopramide. And certainly the combination of haloperidol and metoclopramide in a patient who is on uh, long-term antipsychotic uh, agents, you need to sort of think um, whether you could be doing harm here. Um, you can see it as well, or a similar thing to it in patients who've rapidly withdrawn from their Parkinsonian meds. And I know that there's kind of a big push at the moment about um, the importance of making sure patients get their Parkinsonian meds on time. Um, but it is something to be in the differential of a patient who is suddenly very hot in whom those medications have been stopped, or maybe they have been given uh, via, for example, the oral route when the patient isn't absorbing. And you can also see it if you have a patient who comes in 
on buscopan and that gets stopped very rapidly. Um, what do we see? We see a massive increase in CK and that's because they get this rhabdomyolysis um, and they get, can get an acute kidney injury from it. They can get arrhythmias, they can go on to have an MI, they can get this kind of chest wall rigidity because of this, this lead pipe rigidity that they get and that can actually be um, enough to leave on to respiratory failure. And they can also get sort of secondary liver failure, which again is sort of essentially cooking their liver. Um, and again, it's a medical emergency. You want to stop what's ever precipitating it, give them supportive management, actively cool. And that means ice packs, getting the Arctic sun out, you know, cool IV fluids into, into their veins, maybe even thinking about more invasive forms of cooling them down. You can give them um, benzodiazepines and you can also give dantrolene, which is what we use in malignant hyperpyrexia. And you give a slightly lower dose than you'd give in MH. So in MH, you give sort of two to 10 milligrams per kilogram. But in neurolept malignant syndrome, you give one to 2.5 milligrams per kilogram. And remember, the most important thing about dantrolene is it takes lots of people. It comes in lots of tiny little bottles and it's quite a pain to mix up. So the most important thing you need is manpower to mix up your dantrolene if you're going to give it. So almost at the end, so what are we, what are we gonna do? So you've got a patient on the ICU who's got what I call a proper pyrexia, so a temperature of more than 38.2, so 38.3 and above, and you don't know where it's coming from. So what are you gonna do? I mean, none of this is rocket science. Have a look at them, take cultures, do some imaging, think about changing lines. So that's the stuff you would do for anyone with you think they've got infections. Um, you probably are, if you've got a critically ill patient, you probably are going to think about either starting or changing the antibiotics that they're on. The next thing you need to think about is how hot are they and do I need to actively manage this? Um, and like I say, if it's a lower grade temperature, um, you might want to think about cooling them down if they've got bad brain, bad heart, bad lungs, um, vasopressure resistant shock. And certainly if it's a temperature over 39 and you've got any of those things, you're going to want to, to cool them down. The next thing you're going to consider is, is there something non-infectious here that is causing my patient to be hot? So could they be withdrawing either from drugs they've taken beforehand or drugs we've given them and stopped? Could there be um, something, have they suffered an MI, a DVT or a PE? Because those are all medical emergencies that if you treat with antibiotics, they won't get better and you need to identify. Is there some kind of sepsis mimic here? Have they got a cancer? Have they got something autoimmune? Is this an inflammation, not an infection? Have they suffered a bleed into their head or some kind of other intracranial event? And actually, is this a drug fever? Is this iatrogenic? And then at two to three days down the line, you know, have any of your microbiology tests come back? And what is happening to the temperature and the inflammatory markers? And actually, can we stop the antibiotics? Is this likely to be the 50% of patients who don't have an infection and aren't going to get better with antibiotics? And I think that is it. I'll happily take any questions and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Kaz. Does anybody have any questions? Silence, Stunned <laughs> silence, either a good thing or a bad thing. Um, um, hi, I'm one of the ACHOs in Less Um Just wanted to know, um, when we were reviewing patients and their temperatures are about, let's say, uh, 38.1 or 38 degrees, I mean, um, would that warrant us to then afterwards start treating as sepsis? Because from what I understand, um, you, you, if the temperatures are above 38.3, that's when we start to consider um, uh, treatment uh, for, uh, if, if there are signs of infection. So I was, I was, I was just... Uh, so I, I, I think what we need to get away from is a knee jerk. This patient has a temperature of 38. We need to start antibiotics. And that's kind of actually the, the sort of aim of, of doing this presentation. I mean, I think the first thing you can say is that doesn't count as a fever because it's 38.3, which might save you having to do cultures on lots of people at four o'clock in the morning. Um, 
I, I think the answer is to have a look at the other thing. You know, we've got lots more information than just temperature, haven't we? We've got what was their temperature doing up until then? Actually, if it's been high 37s for the 12 hours before that, and then you've got one temperature of 38, that's probably just the sort of the same temperature. And that's what that's how accurate the thermometer is. If it's been down at 35.5 and then suddenly you've got a temperature of 38, that probably is a spike in temperature. So certainly look at the trends. And the other thing I would look at is their inflammatory markers. Now, again, that's not the be all and end all because there's lots of things that can put your CRP up that aren't an infection. And there's lots of things that can put your white cells up that aren't an infection. But it gives us a bit of an idea. Um, so if everything's going in the wrong direction, I, I still think that the patient who has a temperature of 38.1, you'd still want to have a look at them because actually, have they got a line that looks a bit red? Have they got murky looking urine? Have they got crackles on their chest? Are they on the vent and the nurses are saying, actually, we're getting loads of gunk up off their chest on suctioning? You know, because all those things would say there probably is an infection here. Um, but I think that the knee jerk must start vitamin T tazacin because the temperature is 38.1 is something we really need to get away from um, because we might do harm to our patients. The nurses will still ask you to come and take blood cultures because their temperature is 38.1 on a regular basis. But Kaz's talk gives you some ammunition to say no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. The paper I'm presenting was published last year. Uh, it was basically on the target oxygen saturation in critically ill patients admitted to intensive care. Uh, so basically, they have what have done. They have so the, the data before that. There's a lot of data suggesting uh, one SATs is better than the other SATs, or they are same, or one is poorer than the other. Uh, the the data before that mostly uh, was observational, which we normally see in intensive care. Some of that was uh, randomized control as well. Uh, as we know that if we expose our patients to higher oxygen uh, and they get hyperoxemia, there are a lot of consequences of that as well. Uh, free oxygen radicals and injuries related to that. Uh, it affects their immunity and so many other things. Similarly, if you expose them to hypoxemia, there are consequences for that of that uh, of that as well. Uh, and uh, if you kind of choose a saturation in the middle of that, you can either go up and down. Uh, some people will say it's safe as well. Uh, so that kind of was the background. So the randomized controlled trials before this 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 trial were uh, mainly suggesting that there is no significant difference in outcome uh, between different target saturations basically and but observation studies uh, were more kind of favoring the intermediate saturations like 90, 94 to 96% that's more safe than the higher or the lower oxygen saturations so in this study is basically a pragmatic unblinded cluster randomized cluster crossover trial. So basically what they have done is it's a single unit trial. Uh, what they have done is basically they have randomized uh, periods into uh, into end of different saturation groups. So what it is two months of SATs 88 to 92, two months of SATs 92 to 96, and two months of SATs 96 to uh, or, uh, 96 or above. So all the patients admitted to that intensive care units who were um, invasively uh, ventilated, they had this target for two months. And then they randomized these clusters so that there is no seasonal variation, like not every time the low saturation is falling in the winter when the mortality is high, you get more viral illnesses. So they randomized this, this, these periods, uh, basically like uh, these two months periods. Uh, so they not only targeted the oxygen saturation, they targeted the PO2 as well. So the low low uh, target saturation group had target of 88 to 9, uh, sorry, target of 90% with range of 88 to 90% and PO2 of 8. Uh, intermediate uh, 
target group has a target of 94 with the range of 92 to 96 and PO2 of 9.33 and higher uh, uh, target suggestion group had uh, target SATs of 98, a uh, range of 96 to 100 and PO2 of 14.6 and above. So they, they enrolled the patients from 1st of July 2018 to 31st of August 2021 with a gap for few months of uh, of uh, basically for for covid uh, and then they, they started a study again so they had about i think th the total letter is 36 months so two months uh, blocks of three different saturation group means six blocks of those which were randomized uh, so they admitted uh, so they enrolled the patients who were either uh, intubated in ed or the or their intensive care unit. As I said, it's a single uh, uh, single uh, unit trial. So including criteria was more than 18 years old, located in ED and ICU, and within 15 minutes of uh, intubation. Uh, excluding criteria was pregnant, incarcerated, or COVID-19 positive. As I think I've already mentioned that how they how they have uh, randomized. Uh, another thing to mention was last seven days of each two month period were wash off, wash out period. So they collected the data data, but they did not include that into analysis. Uh, outcomes were primary outcome was ventilator free days. So number of days a uh, patient is alive and free of ventilation in first uh, post extubation in first 28 days and secondary outcome outcome was death. Uh, this, these are the most two out common outcomes which you use anything related to ventilation uh, in intensive care. Uh, so st statistic analysis, so they, they find out that to have a 92% power to the study, they need 2250 people, uh, patients to be enrolled to get a alpha level of 0 0.05, uh, an absolute difference of two ventilator free days. So while doing the analysis, they adjusted for age, sex, race, ethnic group, source of ICU admission, vasopressor receipt, uh, acute diagnosis and enrollment, and severity of illness as assessed by the non respiratory service board. So all those uh, characteristics were all equal in all three groups. Uh, non respiratory service score very comparable. Uh, their diagnosis on admission, all common diagnosis like out of hospital, cardiac arrest, MI, all those things, sepsis, everything was very comparable amongst the group. It's so uh, it's so comparable that it looks like unreal to me, to be honest. Everything is like mean, exactly same, uh, uh, which if you read the uh, their supplementary data. So the, they enrolled total 3024 patients. Uh, they were eligible. They enrolled 2987 patients. A few of them were excluded because of different reasons. Uh, eventually, they have 808 patients, lower target group, 859 in the intermediate group, and 870 in the uh, hard target group. So it's again the same thing which I was mentioning. The reason of exclusion is mentioned there prisoner, COVID, pregnant, younger than 18. Uh, baseline characteristics were again very similar. Uh, their median age, their uh, gender, rare race, uh, their uh, their uh, uh, comorbidities like COPD, coronary artery disease, and stage renal disease. Their admission uh, reasons like cardiac arrest, acute myocardial infarction, sepsis. They're all very comparable and 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 similar. Uh, safety data was again they were uh, all three groups uh, were uh, were comparable so the incidence of any cardiac arrest arrhythmia myocardial infarction ischemic stroke pneumothoraces or pneumomedicinum they were all similar in three groups slightly higher uh, incidence of uh, pneumothorax and pneumomedicinum in the people who were ventilated for longer number of days uh, in the higher target group otherwise they were very comparable uh, Bradycardia was more common in a low set, uh, target saturation group. Again, I think it's uh, not a surprise. So result wise, uh, it's very similar primary outcome. Uh, ventilation free days was 20 uh, at 28 days was 20 days in lower uh, target saturation group, 21 days 
in intermediate and 21 days in a higher target saturation group. And similarly, secondary outcome of death was nearly 34% in all the groups, which was again very similar. Uh, this slide basically tells you the number of uh, ventilated. So everyone uh, kind of uh, started at the all the if you see all three lines are very very uh, kind of uh, they are moving together basically uh, in 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 terms of uh, their uh, ventilated free days or or, or death deaths basically mortality. Uh, this slide is a little bit busy, but again, it it is saying that all uh, the outcome in these subgroups, uh, cardiac arrest, uh, sepsis, uh, respiratory distress syndrome, uh, myocardial infarction. So these all admission uh, diagnosis. They, this is almost similar as well. So no significant out, uh, out, uh, outcome difference. So uh, author concluded here that the number of ventilator free days and incidence of deaths did not differ statistically among the groups. Uh, no apparent difference in the subgroup analysis, as I mentioned earlier on. Patient in ICU receiving uh, invasive mechanical ventilation targeting saturation value as, a, as low as 90% does not prevent death or expedite liberation from the me mechanical ventilation. So if you target sets 90 or 98, you probably won't get any significant benefit in terms of extubating them early or less uh, days on ventilator or preventing or causing deaths, basically. So what this, this is what it says. Uh, the previously noted U-shaped observation that middle saturation group like 90 to 96 is better than the others. I think this study has refuted that as well. Uh, so the I think that study strengths are the study design and uh, enrollment process has quite significantly ruled out any any uh, any biases because you are getting two months or all of the unit is on the same target saturation group. So you're not choosing or allocating people to any group. And the periods are being randomized uh, with a program. So it, it, it is taking, uh, I think, any clinician led bias away. A uh, sample size for ITU is, I would say, decent. In a single ITU, 2,500 patient is very decent size. So they, the previously, most studies done previously, they were kind of recording data at like two hours, four hours, or six hours. Here, they were recording data every minute, automatically uh, with by a computerized program, and they were kind of putting in 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 uh, putting the values as mean of whole hour. So it's like they have uh, quite good, I would say, data collection in this way. Key subgroups, which we see in intensive care uh, admissions, all uh, all medical intensive care, they get out of hospital cardiac arrest, MIs and sepsis and ARDS. They were all all representative in this uh, in this group and equally. Uh, and then enrollment uh, was again not delayed. So normally. It's very kind of you don't know what we're doing in the first hours and then things cool down and then you kind of uh, change things. But here I think they have enrolled because every patient was being enrolled. So it was easy for them to do that, uh, that every patient is being enrolled and they did it in uh, uh, within 15 minutes. And again, as I mentioned, non respiratory sofa score was comparable. So like organ. Uh, dysfunction was comparable as well in, in, in this group. So they are comparable patients. Uh, limitation, uh, it's a single center uh, data. Uh, it's a non-blinded. Though I think they have, with a study design, kind of uh, uh, counter that uh, th that non-blinded necessarily really, really well. So it's, uh, it, it's because it's blinded or uh, randomized at the cluster level. Uh, so this study is limited to 28 days. Uh, there are kind of potential risks, benefits of these things over a longer period of time. So they are collecting data for further publish publications, but uh, I think the last one was in uh, last year in November. So it will be a while we will get kind of further data that what happened to this patient in 12 months or 24 months. So the, uh, their PEEP, uh, the patients who have their like ventilation modes are comparable. So the, 
the study has not degraded that what mental, mental agent mode you need to give, what peep you need to give, what FIU do you need to give. So they are unit protocol things, how when to extubate. The, everything is unit protocol. Uh, but if you see the supplementary data, you see the peep tidal volume and uh, and their mode of ventilation, they are very comparable. And most people are, I don't know why, but uh, they might be unit preference. They are on volume control mode rather than anything else. Quite significantly higher number of patients, like nearly 80% on, 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 uh, in the first day uh, are on volume control modes. And others are on pressure uh, pressure control or, AP, or APRV or PRVC or other modes. Uh, so, but I said that, but these things were not dictated by the study. Uh, what are the inspiratory pressure used? It's not included in, in any supplementary data as well. That would have significant impact on patients. Uh, that might be the reason why they had slightly higher risk uh, incidence of pneumothorax and pneumothorax in the higher target, uh, higher oxygen target group as well. Uh, they have not recorded how many patients were prone in the lower or higher target saturation group. There would be risks and benefits related to that as well. So, but they have not recorded that. I think probably this has this practice has been more popular after the COVID period. Before that was limited to few centers only. Uh, another thing was uh, interesting thing is if you see this uh, this slide, uh, as mean mean oxygen saturation in the target saturation group of 88 to 92 is 94 percent. So the mean oxygen saturation is higher than what they they would like to do. It might be because uh, a lot of them, like people who are on had post cardiac arrest or MI, they don't need oxygen, and they were running 96 or 97 percent, and that's why they that have affected this, and they uh, the mean is like 94 percent, uh, 95 percent mean in the intermediate group. Their ta target was 94, and the range was 92 to 96, and in the higher it's 97, which is in the range. So even in the lower target saturation group the mean was higher than what they were aiming for. Similarly, FIO2 is, uh, is in the trend as well, same, uh, same way. Uh, now I think I just kind of thought, what, how, can it change my, this, this study will change my practice or not? The few things, uh, I think we can be more confident in kind of determining uh, how much oxygen saturation is suitable. Uh, in generally, you will see the ICUs are uh, trending more towards lower oxygen saturation group. It's not, as per this study, it's not kind of giving you significant benefit of it in terms of mortality or weaning them off earlier. Uh, so I'm not sure how much benefit we're going to get targeting lower oxygen saturation or not, because if you're not getting any ventilator free days or outcome of death is not different, then uh, will it be any target saturation group is good or not? So I think, we, but but we can more confidently accept lower oxygen uh, ta target saturation because it will not harm. And similarly, uh, another problem is that if we set the lower targets, it's not going to harm the patient. If you see our, tr our general practice of how we respond to numbers, if a patient is saturating 100%, we might, take a while to wean down the oxygen. But if someone is saturating 87%, we quickly go up by 10 or 20%. So I think if you set a lower target, it, you will probably stay in the range more rather than, you, you won't cause hyperoxemia. You're monitoring the patient constantly in intensive care. So it, there is a risk, the risk of hypoxemia is kind of really, really nil, but risk of hypo, hyperoxia is more in intensive care because we tend to kind of respond to higher numbers less compared to the lower numbers. So weaning is, uh, we, we, we're not very good at turning things down. We are very good at turning things up. Uh, and then again, if it's not going to benefit my patients targeting lower or higher oxygen saturations, do I need to change my practice? Probably not, but I can be more liberal setting a little bit lower oxygen saturation targets uh, so that we can avoid the risk of hyperoxia. Uh, there are a few, couple of slides of 
of relatively good trials or relatively large trials uh, who before this uh, which which looked at these things so hyper s2 s trial it looked at two things mainly one was uh, use of hypertonic saline uh, in sepsis it did not improve the survival and second was setting fio to very high it says that it will increase the mortality so i think we already know that uh, very high, high high oxygen levels are not good so oxygen uh, free radicals and damage because of that another uh, trial was a pilot multi center randomized controlled trial which were conservative and liberal 88 to 92% more than 96% were compared and there was no difference and then a liberal or conservative oxygen therapy for ARDS here uh, it says target such, uh, they compared with again 88 to 92 versus more than 96 here the conservative group had higher mortality in ARDS like 44.9% compared to at 90 days compared to a liberal oxygen group more than 96% saturation group they had less mortality and they had to stop the trial because of significant difference in mortality in practice i think we quite often now target lower oxygen saturations uh, especially in ecmo people like ecmo patients they have target sets of 80% and po2 of 6 and they have very good outcome i'm not sure where we, we will go eventually in terms of this topic uh, that what oxygen target saturation is good and which which, which is not good and then uh, uh, conservative oxygen therapy during mechanical ventilation in icu again uh, usual oxygen therapy did not significantly affect the number of ventilation free days here as well so targeting lower oxygen saturations probably won't help much and lower or higher oxygen target groups for acute hypoxemic respiratory failure again lower uh, oxygen target did not result in lower mortality so i think everything is saying that probably lower and higher oxygen saturation group are similar unless you are subjecting your patients to hypoxemia or hyper hypoxia uh, that's it happy to answer any questions thanks for that sir can i just wait and please put your hand up Oh. <laughs> hey, that's it. So what would that that's great. Thank you. So actually the argument the answer is we don't know. <laughs> but probably avoid too low, avoid too low, avoid too high. Um but which do you think we should titrate FiO2 to? Um SATs or PaO2? <laughs> And why? I think uh, B, uh, if you see if you want to target something to the real time, it probably will be SATs because uh you can't continuously monitor po2 isn't it you can you will have an idea of, you can compare what what at what po2 what the oxygen saturation are and then eventually you will end up targeting oxygen saturation rather than a po2 because it's not a continuous figure and as i as you mentioned this we, we will, so far we don't know what is better but i think in intensive care it's safe to uh, target the lower oxygen saturation as well uh because uh as i mentioned that we it's, it's very common to not wean things and it's very easy to increase things in intensive care so uh, i think it's safer targeting relatively low oxygen saturation in intensive care yeah generally turn everything down and not do anything to your patient no i agree um it, the the, um, the pao2 and the sats thing is something that's quite often asked in exams for anyone who's doing either anesthetic or icu exams um and you're absolutely right there's the practicalities of obviously sats are easier sats are available um in are more likely to be available in low and middle income countries but not necessarily um and actually there's a new definition of ARDS which is using sats and not PAO2 um although i don't know i've only seen that on twitter so i don't know whether that's actually official or not um but, but the other thing is thinking about oxygen delivery and actually when you're thinking about oxygen delivery sats are much more important than pao2 because pao2 gives you your oxygen that's dissolved in blood which is very little compared to sats which you times by hemoglobin times 1.34 
So actually, if you want to give them a kind of physiological, this is what the equations tell us answer, uh, SATs is more important for the patient because it um, gives you a better idea of the oxygen delivery, which is probably more important than the oxygen, um, so, so oxygen content than actually PaO2. But I, I think that our nursing staff do it to the gases. Definitely, they definitely do. Yeah. Why you often have sats of 100 and I wonder if it's the ventilator and turn it down and they get twitched because they keep turning it down and they haven't done a gas yet. Yeah. They don't like it. If they've still got sats of 100, then you can turn it down some more. But you're right, Madassa, less is more. Miko, masterful in activity, cat-like observation. That's what most of ICU should be. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Um, we're doing um, a very similar trial here at the minute. I do think you guys are doing UK rocks, are you at Glenfield? Is it, are you, are you doing, because there's also Mega Rocks, which is a massive, I think that's a, an Australian one, isn't it? Um, yeah, we, we're, no, doing no, we're not doing the UK rocks one. How, how many patients is that? Oh, you, um, Pete, Dr. Head to tell you the answers. Um, <laughs> we've over recruited and actually LRI is the uh, highest recruiting site that they've got participating apparently. Um, but it's 88 to 92 or 94 to 98 percent SATs. I think and we this, would struggle with our cardiac surgeons. That was the people yeah. we would really struggle with. Uh, our surgeons don't notice, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it, it's really brave to cluster everyone to 88 to 92 percent in your unit, isn't it? Yeah, but are they mainly all do you reckon at 92 because that is what the nurses are happier with? Uh, they, they seem to hover around 90 I reckon. Okay. <laughs> a little. I mean, the data will tell us I guess eventually but um, is, it is it Tony Rostrum? He's the guy up in, I met him quite recently, I think he's running it isn't he? He's a guy up, he's, he's from yeah, uh, he's, 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 yeah, and then we've also been, because, because Leicester's so diverse, we've been recruited to the add-on bit to UK Rocks, which is looking at SATS probes accuracy in different coloured skin, because we are quite a diverse population, so that would be quite interesting. We don't have a lot of data comparing 88 to 92 to 94 to 96, something like that, but something that probably need to be now brave enough to kind of go ahead to 85 or something like that as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really, really good uh, with uh, with sets of 80 80 percent as well, isn't it? There's no yeah. hypoxic brain damage or anything else significant damage to them with sets of no. 80 percent. The trials tend to look at mortality or ventilator three days that don't show any difference. It would be interesting to see whether there's any difference in kind of cognition at three mm -hmm. and six months or something. More subtle signs that people don't notice. But I can't be bothered. <laughs> Zoe, there is a post hoc analysis of the so the ARDSNET trial that I was talking about where they looked yeah. at the temperatures. They yeah. have done they did a post hoc analysis, they did they they followed up, I think it was something like a hundred of the survivors, um, to see if they could do like a battery of phone cognitive and neuropsychiatric tests. And really it was a are we able to do this test by phone that was kind of the point of the trial like it was a feasibility trial of can we do the psychological assessment at three yeah. and 12 months by phone and the answer was yes um but they they found that if you were in the if you had uh, worsening hypoxia you had worsening longer term cognitive and psychiatric yeah. problems and if yeah. you were in the fluid so the fluid light group as opposed to the fluid heavy group um, then actually there was a signal that the, you had worse cognition as well, which is interesting because obviously we say to people, yeah, dry everyone out if they've got ARDS. Um, but then you do it, you do have to be alive to be able to be cognitively tested at 12 months. True. Yeah, that's quite an interesting little trial. Indeed. Cool. Um, we should probably get let people do some work. Let me share this. So you can get some feedback and uh, certificates for portfolios and stuff.